more than two weeks have passed since the 7th of October Hamas attack on Israel, but there is no indication of an impending resolution to this conflict. Israel has just launched its ground invasion. Previously, the news related to the war was mostly dominated by news of Israel's deadly campaign of airstrikes on the Gaza Strip and the humanitarian disaster unfolding in this blockaded region. In this video, we will talk about the event that led to the Israeli ground assault into Gaza. This video is made possible thanks to the generous support of our YouTube members and patrons. Their contributions are the backbone of our work. As a token of our appreciation, our patrons and YouTube members enjoy two exclusive videos every week. Currently, they have access to a complete series on Xenophon's Anabasis, the First Punic War, History of Prussia, Italian Unification Wars, Risorgimento, and numerous other fun videos. Additionally, our Pacific War series is ongoing, and we're excited to announce the release of a new series on the Russo-Japanese War and Albigensian Crusades, and much more, exclusively for our backers. If you want to join this fantastic community, you can find the links in the video description and pinned comment. By becoming a patron or YouTube member, you'll gain access to exclusive videos, early access to all our public content, release schedules, wallpapers, and an invitation to our active Discord server, where we engage in lively discussions. Your support is invaluable, and we sincerely thank you for making our work possible. First, let's look at what has been happening on the ground in the past few days before we try to analyze what may happen next. Ever since Hamas perpetrated a massacre in Israel on the 7th of October, the IDF has been relentlessly bombing Gaza, killing more than 5,000 Palestinians, according to the Hamas-led Ministry of Healthcare of Gaza. There are horrific scenes of widespread death and destruction in Gaza. On the 13th of October, the Israeli military called Gazans north of the Wadi Gaza to evacuate south within 24 hours, which was heavily criticized by international human rights and humanitarian organizations, calling on Israel to retract. Associated Press reported that Hamas told people in Gaza to ignore the evacuation order, arguing that nowhere in Gaza was safe from Israeli airstrikes. Later that day, an explosion was reported on one of the supposed safe routes to the south, which local sources claimed to kill 70 fleeing Palestinians. Both sides blamed each other for this deadly war crime, which has become common in this war. Arguably the most consequential event of the past 10 days of the war between Israel and Hamas was the rocket attack or the explosion in the parking lot of Al Ali Arabi Baptist Hospital in Gaza City on the 17th of October. Hamas immediately blamed Israel for an airstrike, claiming it killed at least 500 civilians sheltering in the hospital area. The IDF stated that it would investigate the incident, and later claimed that the explosion was caused by a faulty rocket launched by the Islamic Jihad organization stationed in Gaza. Images from the scene of the incident showed a relatively small crater, several burned cars, and minor damage to the hospital. Much has been said about this incident, as the sides continue blaming each other, while the open source analysts reach different conclusions. Most media immediately blamed Israel for the airstrike, and reiterated the information about the hundreds killed. We do not have definitive data on this, but before this incident, many posts on social media and statements of governments from all around the globe seemed to indicate a great deal of sympathy with Israel due to the massacre of the 7th of October. This was already changing when the IDF launched its campaign of airstrikes on Gaza but the rocket explosion in the hospital was by far the most significant blow to Israel's international support since the start of the war. In response to this incident, Arab leaders cancelled their summit with Biden to be held in Jordan. An airstrike on a UNWRA school on the 17th of October, and one on the buildings of the Greek Orthodox Church of St. Porphyrius on the 19th of October, killing at least 14 people in total, are among other cases of destruction of civilian infrastructure in Gaza in recent days. Israel's Defense Minister, Gallant, told the Neset Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defense on the 20th of October that the war against Hamas will be conducted in three phases. The first phase is currently ongoing in the form of airstrikes, with the purpose of destroying operatives and damaging infrastructure in order to defeat and destroy Hamas. The second phase will consist of lower intensity ground assaults to eliminate pockets of resistance, while the third will aim to create a new security reality in the Gaza Strip, which most probably means a ground assault and occupation. Gallant admitted that the ground assault may take two or three months, 
but some military commentators argue that it may actually take years to occupy Gaza and eradicate Hamas completely. If the Israeli army conducts a ground assault, it would have to carry out most of the fighting in the underground tunnel system of Hamas, the exact location and extent of which is known only to the Hamas leadership and militants. It is reported that some of the tunnels extend to Egypt. In previous confrontations between Israel and Hamas, it was revealed that tunnels were dug into Israel at one point. Evidence from previously revealed tunnels demonstrates that their entrance points are often found in civilian objects, like houses and mosques, in order to avoid detection by Israeli drones, which is one of the explanations behind the IDF use of bunker buster munition in civilian areas. The Israeli army has been training a special unit called Weasel since 2003 to fight in the underground tunnels, but the size of this unit is unknown, and it is unlikely that it will be sufficient to take control of this underground city created by Hamas. The IDF would probably have to deploy its regular units to the tunnels as well, which are narrow and claustrophobic spaces full of treacherous surprises like booby traps. Hamas militants know their tunnels better and will use them to their advantage against Israeli soldiers, most of whom would probably be untrained to fight in such environments. Underground tunnels negate the technological advantage of the Israeli soldiers over Hamas. The Israelis would need special equipment like oxygen tanks and extreme caution to proceed in the tunnels. An attempt to eliminate Hamas in its tunnels will by no means be a walk in the park. It will likely cause heavy casualties for the IDF. One of the common questions regarding the Israeli ground assault on Gaza is the endgame. The Netanyahu-led coalition government has not clearly indicated their vision of Gaza after the ground assault. Does Israel intend to administer Gaza for a while after occupying it? Is Israel going to pass on the administration of Gaza to the Palestinian Authority? Does it intend to annex Gaza? Is the expulsion of the Palestinian population on the table? None of it is entirely clear. The 19th of October Reuters article argues that Israeli officials have said that they don't have a clear idea for what a post-war future might look like. The article notes that US State Secretary Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin have urged Israel to determine its post-war strategy. Reuters also quoted an unnamed regional security source who said that Israel doesn't have an endgame for Gaza. Their strategy is to drop thousands of bombs, destroy everything, and go in. But then what? They have no exit strategy for the day after. The Israeli minister Gideon Saar has told the local media that Gaza's territory must shrink at the end of the war, as whoever starts a war against Israel must lose territory. The foreign minister Eli Cohen also implied that parts of Gaza would be annexed by Israel. But even these statements do not really indicate anything about the future administration of Gaza. So far, the Israeli government has not articulated its post-war plan, and it opens the issue up to all sorts of speculations. The US government continues expressing unequivocal support for Israel's right to defend itself, but has also started to urge restraint. On the one hand, the US has deployed the USS Dwight Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group in the Eastern Mediterranean to deter any third party from joining the conflict. On the other hand, the Americans have been advising Israel to wait for the release of all hostages before launching a ground assault. In his visit to Israel, Biden has called on the Israeli government not to be consumed by rage and avoid the post-9-11 mistakes of America. He also pledged $100 million of humanitarian aid to the Palestinians of Gaza and the West Bank, and called for a two-state resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The US has also struck an agreement with Israel on the passage of humanitarian aid to Gaza from the Rafah checkpoint, along with securing the release of two Israeli-American hostages. The American policy on this matter continues to focus on support to Israel and deterrence of third parties from entering the war. But in recent days, the US government has also been trying to not alienate the Arab and Muslim world too much not the least due to the increasing public support for Palestine against the background of Israeli airstrikes on Gaza. The American deterrence policy primarily focuses on the threat coming from Iran and its proxies in the Middle East. In our previous video, we talked about the risk of a second front for Israel from Hezbollah in the north. Iran may also join the conflict in some form, particularly if the Israelis get bogged down in a protracted conflict in Gaza. 
While Iranian boots on the ground are extremely unlikely, since Iran would most probably use its Hezbollah proxies for that purpose, Iran could potentially launch missiles and drones on Israel. The IDF has been targeting the Aleppo and Damascus airports to address these threats. The Assad regime heavily depends on Iran, which can use Syrian territory to launch strikes on Israel. Iran also uses Syrian territory to transfer weapons and equipment to Hezbollah in Lebanon. So far, Iran's involvement has mostly consisted of public statements threatening Israel and talking about its inevitable demise. Like others, Tehran is closely following the situation in Gaza and will undoubtedly get more active if a meaningful opportunity to get involved and influence the situation arises. Iran wants to position itself as the champion of the Palestinian cause in the Muslim world in order to boost its reputation in the Islamic world. At this point, their biggest card in the game is Hezbollah. On the 16th of October, Israel ordered the evacuation of its citizens on the border with Lebanon, as a low-intensity conflict with Hezbollah is already going on. The sides are regularly exchanging fire, which has already led to deaths on both sides. The situation is relatively stable for now, but it may escalate if Hezbollah sees a chance to do damage. A lot at this point depends on whether Israel launches a ground assault on Gaza. The Economist rightly noted that Israel's window of legitimacy in Gaza is shrinking. Even the staunchest ally of Israel, the United States, has called for restraint and delay of the invasion in the face of increasing global outcry against the Israeli airstrike campaign in Gaza. Furthermore, most of the mobilized soldiers in Israel are young people who are part of the workforce. The longer they are mobilized, the more the Israeli economy will feel the detrimental effects of it. The ground assault looked inevitable a couple of weeks ago, but the international reaction may influence Israel to reconsider. On the 23rd of October, the IDF spokesperson stated that if Hamas releases all hostages and surrenders, Israel won't launch a ground assault, but obviously Hamas will not accept this ultimatum. Indeed, while we were animating this episode, Israel started its ground invasion of the northern portion of Gaza. To the surprise of many pundits, on the 27th of October, the IDF launched its large-scale ground assault on the towns of Beit Hanun and Burej. On the same day, the United Nations General Assembly overwhelmingly voted for de-escalation and an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. It is hard to discern what is going on on the ground, as we have almost no information out of Gaza, but it is clear that Israel started the second phase of its operation, and we will talk about it more in the coming days. More episodes on this topic are on the way as we collect more information as we go, so make sure you have subscribed and press the bell button. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord, and much more. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.